Well, it is getting intense out there in the San Diego real estate market. Is this the new normal? John Stenberg is here. What's going on, brother? Hey, great to see you. Likewise. I want to access your 34 years of experience uh, and uh, say, all right, what the heck is going on out there, John? And is this what we're going to see from here on out in San Diego? I, I think so. I mean, let, let's face it, the, we're behind on building. Probably uh, Ward has it on the streets and nationwide over 20 million behind over the last decade. We're at a 50-year low on building. Um, I can go over all those stats, but I want to bore you. But it's we're low inventory. It's not going to happen overnight. I think it's going to be between two and four years. This is going to be like this. Even though rates are popping up somewhere around four, four and a quarter, four and a half, um, I just don't see it stopping anytime soon. I mean, even if the rates hit five or five and a half, you know, um, I think we have a lot of way, I mean, we have two, maybe two and a half years to go with it being this intense. Yeah, and yeah. there's the pie is shrinking, as we yes. both agree, which means that basically there's less transactions yeah. out there, less, less food for people in the industry like us. Yeah. And so um, what is causing that, obviously low inventory, what I would call a housing crisis, a nationwide housing yeah. crisis. What's really interesting about this one mm -hmm. to me, John, is that it's not just San Diego. Mm -hmm. I've always understood low inventory in San Diego, mm -hmm. seller's market. Makes sense. Most beautiful place in the world. I've been all over the place. It's the best place. Sure. Yep. And, um, but it's also in Iowa mm -hmm. and in southwest Missouri. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's everywhere. Yeah. I mean, we have a nationwide housing crisis. And so the big question is, where's the inventory going to come from? Yeah. I, I don't have an answer for that. You know, and I don't either, <laughs> to be honest with you. I mean, if you look at the stats of San Diego, I mean, there we're supposed to be building 20,000 units a year. I don't care if it's rental or housing. Uh, we're under 10 per year. So where do those people go? They build ADUs. They, they get together with roommates. They, you know, and it causes a lot of cars on certain streets. I mean, you can, you can tell, yeah. you know. So I don't know where it's going to stop. Um, you know, I, I've always said... That, you know, oil, the, the gas prices, by the way, I just bought an electric car. I'm so excited. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the new Ionic. Welcome uh, to the electric car. Yes, family. yeah. Uh, five, I'm, I'm real pleased with it. But, you know, everything's high. Uh, rental, um, rentals are high. Gas is high. Everything is high. Um, it's, it's just a, it's a problem. Um, I think some people are just going to just back off and say, I'm just good. I'm not going to get involved in the market. Um, I see people do that. Over the last two years, probably at, uh, at least a dozen um, of my clients, just, we're just going to stay where we're at. Too tough. Yeah. Too disappointing when they get out there and they get rejected four or five or six times. People just don't have the stomach. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, the thing is, you're going to participate in the real estate market one mm -hmm. way or the other. Unless yeah. you live at home with yeah. mom and dad or with an uncle or aunt or something, you're participating in the market one way or the other. Either you're on the rental side, yeah. you're on the uh, demand side for rentals, or you're mm -hmm. on the demand side for purchasing. Sure. Right? Yep. And I think what higher interest rates do, um, it exacerbates the problem even further, John, because now all those sell buyers, mm -hmm. they don't really have a, a situation that makes sense anymore. Right. I've got 2.5% on this house. We bought it three years ago. Our payment's only this much. Yes, we do want to upgrade. Yes, we do want the house with the pool, but look at how much more it's going to cost us. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of those sellers now become dormant, mm -hmm. which we would have otherwise had. Right. It also takes buyers who are like, yeah, but this is my payment threshold. I can't get anything that I want for that. So now I have to go to the rental side. So it takes inventory away mm -hmm. from an already crazy hot market. Mm -hmm. And then it also pushes people back towards rentals. Mm -hmm. And it's like this cycle because people go towards rentals. They see how hard that is and how expensive it is. And they go, wait a minute, we should just buy if we're going to pay this much. And they just <laughs> do this loop-de-loop. -loop. Yes. Um, and so we've got a lot of people in those cycles right now because it is a, it's a full-blown housing crisis. Yeah. I had just got a text from a client, and uh, I was going over numbers with him. Um, he's buying out in Ramona, nice. selling his home in El Cajon. I gave him the payment because uh, interest rates went up, and he sent me a text back. I'm moving out of state. I said, are you sure you want to do that? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm moving out of state. This is ridiculous. So a lot of people are hmm. going to Texas, Arizona, but those markets are on fire as well. Yeah. I mean, they are pushed to the uh, limit. I mean, look at... Um, I just sold a, well, help sell someone a home in Austin, and uh, the broker over there that I used uh, the refer over to, um, the market's so dry, he sold my client a, a $4 million condo in downtown Austin. $4 million? Yeah. 
four million in wow. Austin. And he says there's just no inventory. Uh, he got that off market, by the way. He felt lucky. Oh my goodness. Yeah, in, in Austin. Austin, Texas. See, and that's the thing. I, I see the prices in some of these Midwestern states and I mm -hmm. see how high they're getting. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it makes it even more valuable to me, San Diego real estate. Yeah. Like when I see these houses in, in Missouri and Iowa and Minnesota for six, 700,000, mm -hmm. and I'm going, well, yeah, it's more expensive here. It is. Sure. And maybe the house that you're getting isn't as big as that one. Mm -hmm. But the price isn't that far off. I'm talking about monthly payment, John. Yeah. You know, how much are you scratching a check for every month to live in mm -hmm. um, Minneapolis? Mm -hmm. um, nothing against Minneapolis. Yeah. yeah, I hear you. Love Minnesota, love Minneapolis, love the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. But it's not San Diego. Right. It's just not. And there's no way to argue that it is even close. Right. So if we're all honest with ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, paying $1,000 a month extra to live in San Diego is mm -hmm. very cheap, yeah. in my opinion. I mm -hmm. think in the future it will be dramatically different. Yes. And that's where I'm trying to get people to realize the long-term implications of this are all very, very positive for people who own real estate. Yeah. And they should continue to be for some time now. So um, it's, it's hard to not go, wow, this is expensive. We, hey, we've got record inflation numbers. We've got mm -hmm. some of these things that are kind of uh, adding to this. Sure. Yeah. Is that really what it is, though? Mm -hmm. Because before we had these record inflation numbers, just look at COVID, mm -hmm. what happened? Yeah. People pushed the buy button. Yeah. Big time. Yeah, big time. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we thought it, the market would just crash, actually. Right? And we woke up one day and said, holy smoke, look at everybody looking at our listings. Yeah. And all the requests, even with them being at home. So I think a lot of the, even the veterans like myself, we thought, uh, what's going to happen now? Where are we going to be close? For about a month and a half, I think a lot of veterans were, were like, okay, the, we need to readjust our business plan. But it, we had to readjust a different way, in right. a positive way. So um, I actually think right now, a lot of people call it an extreme seller's market. You think about this market uh, until just over the last couple of weeks, the rates went up. It was really a buyer's market. Hmm. Think about that for a minute. So what you buy today is going to be probably about $75,000 more in a year from hmm. now in the zip code that you buy in. The seller's probably leaving money on the table. That's, okay. That's an interesting point. And rates were in the threes. Now, yeah. when I got in the business, rates were at 10 and a half, 11 and a half, 12 percent. I mean, they're still selling like hotcakes, different time, late 80s. I don't want to date myself. But um, <laughs> the, the market now to buy, now we have a lot of people thinking now what you said, and I got the text the other day saying, hey, I, this is too much. The rates went over four and a half percent. But if you've been around for a while, four and a half percent, still cheap money. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, since 2008, that's about the average rate. If you go back to 2008, so pre-crash, yeah. mm -hmm. but right, right before sure. the crash, yep. and you just look at that data, the average rate, and mm -hmm. this includes VA, FHA, conventional, jumbo, everything that's reported um, is about four and a half percent. Yeah, we just haven't had the craziness. And when I say craziness, the $100,000 over list price, removing all contingencies. And that's what I think a lot of people are just, they're getting sick to their stomach. Um, you know, I have, I have a friend in the Bay Area, uh, he was just in the news, $800,000 in one of the suburbs of uh, San Francisco, over list price. Mm. So people are like, you know, this is crazy. You know, it is. It's tough psychologically because you yeah. look at a list price mm -hmm. and you think, okay, well, it's not going to go for that, it's going to go over. So then you pick some number that's like 10% over and you start calculating payments and you sure. start to associate mm -hmm. this home with that payment. Mm -hmm. And so when someone tells you, no, it's going to be more than that, mm -hmm. and you already have sort of prepared yourself for it being higher than it should be in your yeah. mind, mm -hmm. that's the, the difficult part as a buyer, yeah. is to kind of go through all those different waves of, no, it's not that much, it's this much. And yeah. oh, and then the rate went up a little bit too. Yeah. And so now it's, it's this much. Yeah. And so that's where I think the buyer psychology is suffering. Have you noticed this at all in listings, though? Have you noticed a decrease in the number of offers you're getting or the veracity of those offers at all? You know, um, I haven't really. I mean, when, when let's say you have a typical listing on the market, let, let's just pick 700, you're always going to have that first buyer, you know, the buyer that just got out, started looking, they're going to maybe make an offer at 695, 690, or 700. Uh, or, you know, and then you, you get those buyers at 710, 715. And then you get that buyer that says, Every, I'm, I'm going to get this property, I'm going to go 755. You know, I've been looking for eight months, and I this is the location. You know, so 
I haven't really seen less offers. You know, it's always been like that over the last couple of years. A little below, a little at list price, and then someone very frustrated just going well over. Someone who's in there who's who's making the mark. Now, mm -hmm. let's do a little advice here. Sure. So for let's start with buyers since we're on yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So advice for buyers in that situation. I know yeah. a lot of buyers they want to come in guns blazing. They want to say, I want to put my best offer in there. I want them to see that we're the best. Mm -hmm. Is that the right way to go? Um, yeah, um, I, I, I think you put your best foot forward in the first offer. Uh, don't hold back. Don't think, oh, they're going to counter me. Uh, I'll just wait, hold back, and see what they counter. I think if you like the home, if it's the location, it may not be the perfect floor plan. You can change. You can knock down walls. You can change things. Um, cosmetically as well, but if it's the right location for your kids, for the schools, uh, for work, you know, getting on off the freeway, um, I think you go for it. You, you put all your chips in. Um, I always tell people there's no perfect home out there. You, you probably get up to 85% of all your wish lists, and then you can kind of personalize it and customize the home afterwards, you know. Um, right now, though, um, you maybe lower those expectations, mm. you know, down to maybe 70, 75 percent of what you want in a home. Also, uh, I just talked to a client coming from the Bay Area and she wanted just one zip code. And I said, let's just expand your zip code, six or seven other zip codes. And we talked about it for about 45 minutes and uh, 11 other properties popped up. You know, so you got to expand your area. <laughs> yeah, just 11. For six zip codes, wow. <laughs> just 11. Well, follow-up question on that. Yeah. For that buyer, you said, okay, hey, put all your chips on the table. Yeah. If you're going to do that and you know you can't improve on the counter, yeah. um, do you put a time limit on it? Do you say, hey, okay, here's our best foot forward, but we need a response, yes or no, within 24 hours. Do you take a more aggressive approach if you're really going to lay it all out there? Um, in, unless it's, if as an agent, if you know that it's the best offer, you know, no contingencies, um, you know, no appraisal, no loan, uh, where you, we don't even need to look at HOA docs. Yeah, you can probably, you know, try it, but sometimes the listing agent will go, you know what, that's not going to work for me. I'm going to wait for the weekend, and that is a buyer's nightmare because now they have your offer that you said, I want an answer by 5 o'clock on Friday night, and it's probably not going to work out because everybody's going to be over list price and they want to entertain all offers. So it's, yeah. I don't think that works very often unless you uh, know the agent and it's good to be networked. And uh, maybe the agent, I, I approached an agent just recently, I said, I know you're going to have an open house, but would you take an offer, you know, $50,000 over list price? He said, I'll show it to you today. And I said, great. And I, I believe he was going to accept our offer, but my buyer opted to look at another property and make another offer. So some veteran agents will say, hey, you know what? Let's look at this. He's a good, solid agent. If he makes an offer, we're going to close. Yeah. Uh, instead of entertaining 48 showings and 14 other offers. Um, it becomes pretty messy, right? I mean, at a certain point, like when you're... So let's talk, let's talk about that side of it. I mean, like from a listing standpoint, you know, do you... How do you position yourself for success here? Because I know yeah. you, you can still make mistakes. Yes, it's a seller's market. Sellers can still make mistakes. You can. H how do you avoid that and capitalize on this? Well, I, it's your gut. It's your experience. Um, if you're a listing agent and you take an offer before it, you, know, you have the whole weekend to show, um, you better be feeling pretty confident that this is the best offer and you're not going to show it. You can still show it for backup offers, um, but you know, it's your gut. You know, is this the best offer I'm going to get? And sometimes you're wrong, you know, but how could you be wrong when you, you get $50,000 over list price? Yeah. That's not too bad. <laughs> so you probably risk another $10,000 you're leaving on the table. Uh, values have already went up $125,000 over the last 15 months in the neighborhood. And then you get another 50000 So what are you losing? Yeah. You know, your gut will tell you, hey, listen, this is a good offer. Let's work with this offer. When you have a buyer that knows that, hey, you took it off the market for me, they're going to perform. They're going to appreciate that. Yeah. Or as a listing agent, you want to just make sure, listen, I did you a favor, you know, please perform on time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you always have that two-minute chat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? yeah. So. John Stenberg, thank you so much for your time. Man. It's great to have you. This incredible wisdom you imparted on us. Guys, share this video with your friends. Let's help make them smarter than everyone else.